Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to see such a, a full room. Uh, we've got a really fascinating program. Um, uh, most of the speakers are well known to most of us, but maybe not everyone. So a very quick introduction and then over to you, Delwyn. Delwyn is a member of our committee, uh, ex-RCO employee, now runs his own business, a volunteer at TNMOC, where he, and he leads the 2966 MHPC project team, so well, well within this space. Uh, again, Brian's well known to, to a lot of us. Uh, he did work for ICL Data Skill and uh, became a, a consultant. I love it, but he said he spends his time reviving um, 1900 software. <laughs> and then David Holdsworth. <laughs> who uh, worked at Leeds University since 1967, KDF9, I understand, then 1906A. Um, so all people with a wealth of experience and, and I say, authority in the subject. So I'm going to say no more, except over you to Delwyn, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction, and thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. It's good to see, as David said, such a full room. Um, I'm Darwin Holroyd, and I'm chairman, amongst other things, of our 1900 working group in CCS. So what we thought we'd do this afternoon is give you a little bit of an overview of the different things that we do in the group. Um, don't worry about that. <laughs> these are just these are just calls, but there'll be a reason for this. Um, so mainly what we what we get up to is we, we develop various emulation technologies and we get involved in software recovery. Um, amongst other things, but this is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Now some of you may be looking at me and my relatively youthful um, <laughs> compared to other people. I'm wondering how on earth I got involved in 1900 preservation, which is something I actually asked myself once a while as well. So this is the reason. Um, this is the uh, chemistry block room at Manchester Grammar School in about 1985-ish, and that's an ICR 1902T. Um, I was a pupil at Manchester Grammar School in the 80s, uh, and I was very much involved in this system, which was pretty much operated and maintained by pupils. Uh, the teacher in charge was a certain Alan Pickwick, who some of you may know is the new CCS Northwest Group Secretary from this year. So my experiences with this system uh, led to me <coughs> obtaining sponsorship from ICL when I went to university and subsequently to me working at ICL during the early parts of my career, where I had obviously missed all the 1900 stuff by quite some years and I ended up working on the Series 39 SX machine uh, on the ACP for that, and also VOE development and various other things. Anyway, enough about that, um, let's move on to the speakers this afternoon. So first of all, uh, David Holdsworth, who's already been introduced, is going to talk to you about um, this project, the George 3 Executive Emulator, which we'll call G3EE to uh, keep it snappy. Um, I later got involved in this project as well, but David is the originator, so he's going to tell you a little bit about how that came about. Uh, then I'm going to come back and talk about how I've made use of that emulator within the 2966 restoration project, which I also lead at TNMOC. And then a little bit about how we physically go about recovering software from ancient magnetic tapes. And then rounding off the afternoon, Brian Spore is going to take the floor, and he's going to give you a brief introduction to the 1900 range of machines, and then he's going to talk about the um, some of the emulation work that he's been doing along with Bill Gallagher, a bit more in a moment, uh, and a little bit of demonstration of the software that we've recovered running under emulation. And Bill, unfortunately, he was supposed to be here today, but he couldn't make it, so we brought him in via Skype there, as some of you can see. <laughs> Hello, Bill, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Bill will be available. If anyone has any questions, Bill will be available during the Q&A at the end as well. So uh, I think without any further ado then, let me introduce David to the stage to uh, give you this part of the presentation. What do I have There you go. Lovely. So that's me. Um, 
Uh, early in my computing career, which sort of started about 1965, I found, got in, I was much taken by the thought of compilers written in their own language. And then, even more surprised, CP67, uh, which would, was an operating system that would run under itself. This ran on the IBM 36067, which I think was probably the first 370, just as the IBM 370 165 was the last 360. Um, you know, IBM's nomenclature is not completely uh, self-descriptive. And now, when you do this, the privileged instructions become illegal, uh, but they're not substantially different from extra codes to use 1900 terminology. So, um, <coughs> I developed for our own use George 3 running under George 3 because at the university we did find that George 3 was, shall we say, not quite uh, up to snuff in some respects. <coughs> and uh, so, as was the tradition in those days, we got to work on it. After all, we'd previously implemented a system on the KDF9 which had been really quite successful. We've got a past user in the audience in Andy Herbert, so you can ask him if it was any good. And we gave it out free to universities, uh, some of whom at least used it. We offered it to ICL, but they said they didn't need it, they didn't want it. But I rumoured that they heard it, they used it later. Um, but it was very much a precursor to the George 3 exec emulator, which I forgot, Delvin's kind of changed the name, which is entitled to do, because that's what I originally called it. And why it's called exec is because when George is running your executive, his structure is um, like that with the executive um, and the user programs, and in a sense they share the processor, but the interface between George and executive is different from normal user programs. So when you, uh, <coughs> when a user program says something to executive, much of the time it's immediately notified to George who then uh, conducts the dialogue. Um, in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that because there's actually a job description file <coughs> which in modern Unix terms it is like the console stream, you know, if you're using um, command line input on Unix. And then and you start to use the programs. Now that's fine if you put George, come on, press the right button, it works. Um, if you put George 3 in there, then that doesn't quite work because, of course, George 3 obeys uh, an instruction which uh, only that George 3 was allowed to obey. And what happens is that it's flagged as illegal. And so he then. So it then goes to the job description file. And we discovered that by adding a little bit onto the bottom of George, we could emulate the executive function in an ordinary program. And this is what gave us George under George, and we could then develop modifications to George, test them without interrupting normal service, uh, which is the sort of thing that normal end users were not very keen on. So, when you're running George 3, there is still this Perry instruction, the 1900 peripheral instruction, and you, it's very important if you're using that technique that the instructions that are unique to the special George interface are illegal in the other one. Fortunately, this instruction, has, which has a different data format, Normally it points at the control area, and George points at the word that points at the control area. By sheer good chance, it was always illegal, and so that made it all work. And that, I can't remember <laughs> it was, but it was. Uh, so that led, when later on in the 90s, um, and we were kind of you start to get nostalgic about things. But basically, at Leeds University, um, we 
the, the KDF9 was in the 60s and ran until 72 as a main user service. It carried on for students longer than that. 72 was the 1906A, and the very end of 79 was an Amdahl, the video CMS system, and then we got into the Unix, Spark, and um, Silicon Graphics, and people like that. So when we were in this Unix world, I thought we were just sort of throwing away data. And somehow we felt this was a historic time in UK computing, and we should make some attempt to preserve it. Now, just that we emulated the extra codes which George used um, in order to run it as a normal program, you can emulate all the instructions and then you can run it on any old computer. And we knew that there was nothing sort of time critical inside George because it would have shown up when I was running a George under George. So we chose then not to emulate the raw hardware, which would have been a a possibility, and in fact there, is, there are people doing that, um, but by emulating the, the George 3 executive, um, we had something that would run on any old machine, and in fact we've run it on about every machine I've ever had any access to, and I actually demonstrated it uh, on a Raspberry Pi, uh, which mentioned later. Because to do, emulate the raw hardware, we would have needed an executive, which I didn't have. Um, it was much more complicated, becomes model specific, and in any case, that information wasn't in the public domain in the 1990s. So, this program that grew, I wrote it in C. Now, in the 1990s, why? Did, well, C. It, there's actually a subset of C, which informally I call C minus minus. And it avoids things which don't have a ready Java equivalent. The idea being that there's an intersection, the sort of semantic intersection between C and Java, which is probably a programming language or a semantics you can find in a large number of programming languages. So it should be easy if you want to transmute it to a new language. Uh, there is a paper called Seeing Ahead, which uh, describes it, and you find it with Google. Um, there are 13,411 lines of code. I think that's the latest version. It's a fairly recent one, anyway. Um, and it's actually very difficult to find a machine for which there's no C implementation. In fact, only Microsoft ships machines without C compilers by default. That's not quite true, but uh, you've got to hope for it on Macintosh, I think. Um, now, a key part of George's mock, the multiple online programming, as they call it, that they tell you to have access, where the communications processor was called 7903. In those days, all proper computers had four digit numbers. You know, IBM had still held four digit numbers. Um, so, they, we used TCP IP to emulate the communication. <coughs> And I wrote a Java program called ICL 7903, would you believe, uh, which actually emulated the protocol. It, it run as a separate job. You could even run it on a different machine um, just with the TCP IP connection because there was no attempt to emulate the actual 7903 processor, just as I didn't attempt to emulate the raw hardware, but instead emulated the executive because that's what George runs on. And then the teletypes are just emulated by telnet calls to that ICL 7903. Of course, in this world where everything has to be encrypted, uh, we, we probably, uh, it's difficult nowadays to find a telnet command. But there's a thing called putty on the PC, which will do it. Um, now, eventually, we needed a real system so we could actually get a copy of George. Now, I discovered a George 3 system running on a 2966 at British Steel in Rotherham, uh, which was convenient, not conveniently located as I at the time it in Leeds. And I collaborated with their support guy called Dave Higgins, who worked for Cap Gemini, who were the outsourced uh, IT suppliers to British Steel. And he got the permit from Fujitsu. And I've he got a paper letter from Fujitsu and he never kept a copy of it. 
we, so I'm afraid I just thought from Jitsu know about it, should we ever get into dispute with them? <laughs> I think that we all are committed for some historical study, and perhaps some of the stuff we're talking about today goes a bit beyond that. Um, but we transferred the system on industry standard mag tapes, which was still very much in use on the Unix systems. And we run it on the, a big spot, well, it doesn't count as big nowadays, but uh, a big spot machine or little PCs. And so that was it. Dave Higgins and me um, sort of transferred it. But then we got an email <laughs> from Darwin. <laughs> <Lloyd. laughs> and, and he preserved the MGS file store. Um, so all sorts of more my tapes shoved around. I remember at one point I left home with my daughter in Finsbury Park and the Delman picked his up. Um, and he's added lots of good stuff and used program execution. This project goes more to Delman than to me now. Um, but then Donald Trump is not alone. We've had our Russian collaborators too. <laughs> you see, the best thing on the 1900 was the Algol 16 <coughs> R compiler. Um, I suppose Belfast Pascal was the next best. Um, now the system file for this Algol 60 R compiler on the MGS file store, for some reason, was complete nonsense. Don't, we don't know why, but anyway. So what we need was to get a little copy. So, because British students seem to need to academic types to find out. So, I tried to contact <laughs> Philip Woodward, who actually was the, the chief producer of the system. We used to work for RSRE Morgan, as it was then called. So I rung them up, and I'm sure the lady on the phone said, well, now Philip Woodward is no longer with us. In fact, we're naming a building after him tomorrow. <laughs> and so I knew the editor of Computer Witch at the time, so I got him to put a little piece in about looking for this software. And that Philip Woodward was dead, you see. <laughs> well, <laughs> and in fact, he only died in January this year. <laughs> um, a very cordial email, I might point out. The only snag was he didn't have the software. Well, this issue of Computer Weekly drifted around the world. Don't forget, we're, you know, we're just emerging from the sort of Cold War sort of time. And I got an email from Alexei. I'm not sure whether it was in Leningrad or St. Petersburg, but it was about the time it changed its name. And he'd actually got Alba Sinclair Tar, and we did a ginormous FTP from Alexei, yeah, and, and actually, and then it worked. Um, so we now have Alba Sinclair Tar all working. So then, Delwin now owns it, and he's even changed the name, about which I have not complained. Um, the original goal was to preserve historic software. You see, I'm a slight oddball. I think software is so important that preserving hardware is not, it's only a second level consideration. But um, somehow I find software more interesting. That's the truth of the matter. Um, so I think we've preserved the NICL 1900 without any need to preserve the actual hardware. Because frankly, when you're using it, you know, it's just like using a real one. Uh, and I actually demonstrated it some years ago, 2012, on a Raspberry Pi um, in the Science Museum to a CCS meeting, Yonsbach, and so now it's Delvin's turn. Thank you, David. I should say I haven't actually changed the name, it's still called g 3 so <laughs> So, um, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about how I've made use of the emulator um, later on, because um, obviously we developed it quite a long time ago now, but more recently, well, it's, it's probably 10 years ago now, I became involved at TNMOC, and since then I've found a number of different uses for the emulation. So the first one is using emulation to drive a real terminal. So what you can see there on the slide is a picture of the terminal area, the TNMOC by the 2966. And the, the orange terminal on the right there, which is 7501, as you can see, is running George 3. And it is connected not only to the 2966 itself, but via a switch box, it's connected to a box of tricks, which 
looks like a planet, <laughs> and which lives inside a, a, a nearby uh, disk drive. And these, of course, being the days when disk drives were large enough that you could hide things inside them. <laughs> <laughs> to give you an idea of scale, that's about the size of a paperback book. Uh, on the right there, you have a Raspberry Pi, and on the left is a single serial interface. Now, if you're not familiar with the Pi, this is a very, very cheap, as in a few tens of pounds, um, bare bones, computer, ARM-based, very popular with people for building little projects and media players and this sort of thing. Very useful for electronics projects as well. Um, and so uh, it runs Linux, and as David mentioned, the emulator compiles and runs on that environment quite easily. So let's just have a quick look at the structure of it. So, it's time for the laser pointer. So at the top there, you've got the Raspberry Pi itself, which is running Linux. And each of these is a separate process on the Pi. So on the left there, you've got the G3XF, which is the main emulator that runs George. That's talking to virtual disks, which are located on the, the SD card, uh, along with the Linux OS and all the other software. Separate process there, the 7903 Comps controller with its socket connection to the main emulator. Now instead here of running a virtual terminal, virtual VDU, or a, a telnet session for a teletype, there's a new component here which is uh, basically takes the, the ICRC01 protocol messages that come out of the Comps controller and transfer them to a USB serial port, which then takes it inside the FPGA here. Uh, onto the synchronous serial interface and then out to the 7501 terminal at 4800 port. And of course, the reverse of the messages coming back. So, I should also mention that the um, blue board you can see there, so this is the blue carrier board, is uh, a commercially available board that has an FPGA on it and uh, a, a USB port for host communication. The board underneath we built specially for this project, uh, which just basically has the IO level converters on it. Um, and as, as an aside, really, this same system is also used elsewhere in the museum to drive the radar data into our IRIS air traffic control system. And because it's FPGA based, we can just change the firmware to cope with a completely different um, synchronous serial format that our system required. So um, you can see the, the end result there. Normally, when this is running, we have the terminal logged onto a George 3 mock session, and it usually is running Colossal Cave Adventure, as you can see there. Massive adventure game. And again, this is, uh, we only have it in the library, but it came from the Manchester Grammar School files. I think it was actually written or ported by somebody at RAE back in the, back in the day. And uh, so this works pretty well. Um, the only way that users can tell whether it's actually connected to the Pi or to the 2966 is that the response time from the Pi is somewhat faster, <laughs> unfortunately. So. So there was a minor issue with this. Um, museum personnel at the end of the day have to close everything down, um, and there's no easy access into George's operator's console. Well, if you're familiar with George, you'll know that it really needs to be closed down tidily. If you don't, then the best you can hope for is it's going to start asking you whether you want to restore everything from tape. And at worst, it's going to tell you that some important system file is corrupt, and you've got no choice, and you are restoring them from tape, whether you want to or not. So this became a problem, um, and so we thought, well, how can we, how can we resolve this? Obviously, you could get someone to plug in a, a laptop and a, you know, a cable and shut it down from, by logging into the Pi, but they're not going to do that when they're closing up the museum at night. So the solution that we came up with was to actually mend George itself to allow the finish command, which places George down, to be issued from what George calls mock context, which means from any user terminal. Now, of course, nothing you would ever have wanted to do Real back in the day, unless you really want your users to wreak havoc with the system. <laughs> but for this, it purposely works quite well. And when George closes down, the emulator exits, and then the, the script on, that's running on the Pi will synchronize all the Linux file system and prevent uh, any risk of corruption to the file store, and then you can turn the Pi off with uh, with reasonable chance that it will boot up again next time you turn it on. So, that's one example. The second example I'm going to tell you about is installing CME on our 2966. And I'll come back and tell you what CME means in a minute. But if you're familiar with 2900 machines, which I hope a few of you will be, you'll know that VME is the native operating system. It's a virtual machine environment. That's what we would normally have on a 2900 machine. Uh, however, the only copy of VME we have at the moment is stuck on some disks, which we currently have no means of reading and, and, and 
and uh, bring him back online. And um, in any case, that, that installation is very cut down. We don't think there's any compilers on it. I don't think it's very much software. So the question would be, well, what would we actually do with it once we've got it running? How can users actually interact with the system? So um, what we do have is George 3 and the ability to recreate new George 3 systems. Although maybe, as David said, not quite a permission, but we'll cross uh, <laughs> over that. Uh, and there's many compilers available, and as uh, Brian will tell you later, some of the software that we've got, we've got basically an awful lot of choice in the 1900 world. And so we thought, well, what we really need to do to actually make use of our 2966 is to run, run it in 1900 mode. And that's done using the current machine environment, or CME, and that allows you to run both a 1900 and a 2900 environment on the same machine at the same time. Or, as we do, just the 1900 part of that. Um, so that's, uh, that, uh, excuse me one moment. Get to the right place on the next. So that, um, that works reasonably well. Um, but the problem is that we need to be able to install it in the first place. And we have the installation tape. We got that from Lexi in Russia, along with many other useful things. Well, at the time we got them, we didn't realize they'd be useful, but subsequently they did become useful. To create another system disk for CME, you need another machine running CME. So, small problem there. There aren't any anywhere. So, well, what do we do about that? So, CME has to run from disk as well. And, uh, it turns out that real disks of the type that run on the 2966 are not actually reliable enough to run every day in the museum environment. <laughs> so we had to run an emulator to emulate the disks, and I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about that. So what you can see there, the red board is a commercially available board that contains a Xilinx uh, system on chip device known as a Zinc, and that contains uh, some FPGA logic and also a dual core ARM processor running at 800 megahertz, which, as you imagine, is many times more powerful than the machine it's hooked up to. <laughs> the virtual disks are actually stored on a card which you can just see peeking out of the top there. That is a 32 gigabyte micro SD card that's smaller than your thumbnail, but it's the type of card you would have in a mobile phone to store, store your data on. And uh, to, to get data on and off this contraption, we have an FTP connection that runs through the Ethernet port at the top, so we can transfer virtual <coughs> disks to and fro. And on the right there, you've got the actual, um, or actually underneath this old board, you've got the, all the I.O. drivers that actually drive the disk interface itself. And this machine will emulate four separate disks for the 2966. It connects directly into the disk controller at the back. And now all we need then is just a way to create disk images to run on it. So one small extra complication, of course, being a 2900, it needs to be one of these EDS-80 type disks uh, as a system disk. Now, unfortunately, George doesn't have any truck with 2900 disks at all, unless it thinks it's running on a 2900. So the emulator that David and I had come up with was, although not machine specific, was generally a 1900 of some flavor, which it's not quite clear what exactly it is. So we had to work out how to convince George that it's running under a 2900 environment without invoking all of the other changes that come along with that, such as the difference in how it drives its operator's console and various other things which I won't get into. And it, following a bit of research on the source code, it became clear that all was necessary to do was to set a single flag in the communication word. And that was enough to convince George that it would accept 2900 disks but not do any of the other stuff. So then we were able to run our CME installation process on the emulator, on a, on a PC, um, set up the whole system disk, and then essentially uh, copy that onto the disk emulator. There was obviously a little bit more complexity to it than that, but I'll, I'll gloss over some of the details. You get the general idea, but the emulator was really invaluable there. So the final example is software development. Having got the 2966 running, George, we needed some interesting demonstration software that was user-proof to allow users to play with. So what you can see there on the right, we have our, um, what's called Oxod, it's a self-learning noughts and crosses program. 
in that it's, it doesn't know how to play noughts and crosses, it just, when it loses, it remembers not to do that again. <laughs> so it takes, it's a data file, but it takes quite a long time to learn, and then we have to reset the data file as we do occasionally, and it becomes very stupid again. <laughs> but actually, that's fine, because people like, like to be able to beat it. If it's a perfect program, we can never beat it, so people like winning. So again, this program is actually it's written in R160, and uh, it was based on something that we found in our MGS file store, which I remember running back in the day. Um, the changes made just made it a bit more pretty and made it resilient to the things that users would try to do to it, so invalid inputs and so on and so forth. Uh, the second program, which uh, again was based on an MGS program, that's Conway's Game of Life. The core algorithm, again, is R160, in which we had back at school. But this has been very extensively rewritten to provide it a large data file, um, which, which has generated the menu that you can see on the screen there. So it has a number of different patterns built in and information about each one. And the other major change we made was to enable it to draw its board in real time on the screen by just overwriting characters as it goes. And given that this is a 2400 board terminal, that had to be highly optimized to minimize the number of characters that are redrawn each time. So uh, most of this development work was actually done uh, on the bus one week going into, going into work. It's not something you could do on a real mainframe particularly conveniently. So again, um, it's just much more convenient to be able to work on things like that off-site rather than take up valuable time at the museum um, doing things as many of you are sure know. Software development can take a long time. So there you go. So moving on now to something completely separate. Um, how do we actually recover data and software from tape? A lot of the tapes that we, um, a lot of the software that we, that we come across is on magnetic tape, occasionally on cards and other things, but most of what we come across is tape. Um, for the 1900 machines, those are all big open reel half inch tapes. And they can take anything from the early 60s when the 1900 series originated right through to the late 80s. And within that time frame, you have um, basically run from 7-track tapes in the 60s and early 70s, 9-track phase encoded tapes, which were most common in the 70s, early 80s, and then later on in the later 80s, you start to get GCR tapes, and sort of an increasing order of density and complexity to read. Now, you might think that the older the tape is, the more difficult it's going to be to recover, but that isn't always the case. So, particularly tapes from the late 70s and 80s suffer from becoming sticky, and this is literally like, the surface becomes sticky. And that was caused because the manufacturers decided to improve, as they thought, the binding formula that's used to glue the magnetic particles onto the tape backing. Unfortunately, they then discovered a few years later that that formula was hygroscopic. In other words, it attracts moisture from the atmosphere. So no matter how well you keep these tapes, over time, they absorb moisture and, and they become sticky. And the practical effect of this is that the tape will no longer run smoothly over the tape heads. So it will actually get completely stuck on the sharp edges of the head, and that can rip chunks of oxide off the tape, obviously rendering it completely uh, permanently damaged. Um, you can tell if the tape is suffering from this problem, because when you try and read it through a deck, you'll hear a very high-pitched squealing coming from it. Or if it's really bad, it'll just stop, and the capstan won't be able to turn the tape at all. And you'll find that it's actually physically stuck. You might have to clean the heads before you put another tape in. Yes, so lots, well, doing data recovery, you're cleaning the heads every tape run. <laughs> yes. So, onto the decks that we use. So, um, on the left there, you can see a pair of the, uh, the GTS tape decks that are on part of the 2966. Now, these are very modern, high performance, uh, vacuum tape loop type decks. When I say modern, they're you know, 35 years old, but in the context of this kind of tape format, they are the pinnacle of the development uh, process. So they're very fast, they're very safe in their tape handling, there are all sorts of protections against damage in the tape. So they're, they're quite good for this sort of um, application, but they can only do nine track tapes. They can do all kinds of nine track tapes, but only nine track. Uh, on the right hand side there, you can see uh, the interface that we use to connect them up to a PC for data capture, because that's more convenient than trying to do it again through the mainframe. Uh, on the top there, you have the same little blue board that you might have seen on the terminal interface there, and then underneath, you've got um, a board that contains the drivers to talk to the actual I.O., and then the purple cables are, are spare ones from the 2966 that go to the, the huge socket that connects into the huge cable that goes to the peripherals. 
So, um, yes, so not only can we use these steps to read tapes into a virtual format, we can also then recreate real tapes from our virtual ones, which has proven useful as well, both to make a copy and just to make something that never existed originally um, to use on the, on the real machine for demonstration purposes. So to deal with seven track tapes, we came up with this scheme based on a modified HP 7700 deck. Now we've got quite a few of these in the collection at TNMOC. And we discovered, and if you know anything about tape decks, you'll know that seven track tape decks are like hens you can't really get them. And the ones you can get are likely to be ancient and in no fit state for operation anymore. But these HP decks are from the 70s, they're reasonably modern, if I can use that, that term. And um, one of my colleagues at the museum discovered that they had an optional head, which was a combined seven and nine track read only tape head. And we checked all our decks and none of them actually had this option fitted, but he did discover that somebody was selling the appropriate parts, new old stock, never used, um, from America. So we bought those, fitted them in the deck, and we ended up with a, a seven track deck with a brand new head, which was quite nice. And we, what we did was we, uh, we basically bypassed all of the normal deck electronics and took the signals directly off the uh, preamplifiers off the head put them onto this, uh, this board which I designed here which is all the signal conditioning and you'll see that nice blue board again, I'm quite keen on those for very useful for FPGA to face USB down to the PC. So how does it work? Well, the hardware itself ultimately ends up capturing every magnetic flux reversal on the tape, which is how the data is encoded. It doesn't matter whether it's MRZR or phase encoded, it's all magnetic flux reversal at the end of the day. The FPGA then records the time at which each of these flux reversals occurs and puts all that data down the USB onto the uh, USB port back to the, the PC which is capturing the data. And we end up with a rather large raw data file that contains, um, this, as I say, all, the, all these flux reversal times. And then later we run a separate post process which converts all of that back to words, blocks, tape marks and so on. Now the advantage of doing that is that you can do things like correct for extreme skew between the tape channels and other things which the deck would not be able to cope with. And if you do end up with a, a part of the tape that you can't read, um, you can look into the data at some depth and you can have a go at guessing what's gone wrong and how it might be corrected, which again is not something you can do when you're running it through a, a real deck. So for all of our, no matter how we capture it, whether we use this deck or the, the ICL decks or any other method, we, we've adopted a standard file format for all of our tapes. And it's very simple, it's something that David actually originated with um, G3XF. And it consists simply of a length, four byte length, followed by a tape block of that length, and tape marks are stored as all ones. So very, very simple, and, uh, and stores what's on the tape. So back now to the sticky tape problem. Um, looking into this, how to deal with it, um, it turns out that it's fairly common practice in the audio recording industry to bake old master tapes. And that's done almost as a matter of course for tapes of this age where they know this is a problem, because of course, with audio, it's a lot more critical even than data tapes in terms of preserving the high frequencies and so on. You really don't be ripping off bits of oxide of the tape. And the consensus seemed to be that um, baking the tapes 50 degrees for some number of hours um, was about the, the, the right thing to do. Now, it's well below the Curie temperature. The Curie temperature is the temperature at which magnetic particles will demagnetize. I think that's 700 degrees for iron oxide. So we're well below that. There's no danger of demagnetizing the tapes. But if you get it too hot, then of course the tape itself, being plastic, will start to distort, and indeed might even distort plastic reels as well. I couldn't find anything at all specific to people doing this with computer data tapes to work on. But um, it did become clear that domestic ovens are no, in no way suitable for doing this. If you try it, you get a temperature probe in there and you see what happens as your oven thermostat comes on and off. You see the temperature rises and falls by 50, 70 degrees, something like that. <coughs> Huge temperature swing. And also the distribution of temperatures inside is, is very uneven, even with a fan oven. And a lab oven would have been absolutely fine, but they cost thousands of pounds and our budget didn't quite extend to that. 
So, welcome to the, the Tate Baking Oven, aka Food Dehydrator, which I found. And um, so I bought one of these food dehydrators, I thought this sounds like it might do the trick. And it's basically just a low temperature oven. It, it runs from about 30 degrees up to 100 degrees or so, so it's right within the temperature range we need. And it even comes, as you can see, with five handy shelves built in, which are exactly the right distance of It could actually be designed for this purpose. So we did a bit of practicing on unimportant tapes that were in a pretty bad state to see how it worked. And um, following quite a bit of experimentation, it seems that at least 24 hours is actually needed to deal with a, a particularly sticky large reel of tape. And that works best. It's split into multiple sessions with a rest in between. But I think the reason for that is because really you're only drying out the outer layers of the tape because it's very tightly packed in the reel. Um, once you, once you bring it out of the oven, the moisture that's left will then redistribute throughout the tape, and then when you go in again, it will then once again pull the moisture from the outer layers and so on. So every time you do it, you're pulling a bit more out. So again, um, a lot of tapes actually, the danger is only the first couple of inches on the tape anyway, so it maybe doesn't matter if the inside remains sticky, but um, that, that obviously is a, a judgment call. <coughs> So we have had um, actually very good results with this, and I've actually recovered tapes which have been so sticky that they wouldn't even run up to the beginning of tape marker on the deck, to the point that they run perfectly fine and all the data recovered with no errors at all. So we're really happy with that technique, and it's been very useful to tackle the, uh, the large collection of tapes that we put, uh, picked up in February, was it? From Bracknell, um, which you may have read about in Resurrection. Um, we don't know what half of these tapes contain, but some of them might be important, some of them might not be. A lot of them, well, they were all stored in a damp basement, so a lot of them are in a pretty bad state. So over the next few years, and it will take years, we'll be, we'll be going through these tapes and uh, hopefully bringing some of them back to life. So that's all for me. I will hand you over now to Brian to finish off the rest of the afternoon. Right. Oh, thanks, Lewis. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill can't be with us this afternoon um, because of family commitments, but he, when I spoke to him yesterday, he said he was glad he had to cancel, having seen planes, planes landing sideways at Dublin Airport. <laughs> um, I started my career at LBFS straight from school as a trainee programmer and that started in the 1900s, which is my love of them. Uh, Bill and I have been working on this project for some 12 years now, um, taking an opposite view to David, working on a hardware emulation, which does mean we need executives. Um, but at the time we started, we had executives available. Um, just a quick brief for those who don't know, the ITL range was a range of computers over about 20 years, starting with the Franti FP6000, um, which was developed by Franti Canada based on boards designed for the Orion 2 originally. They just put the boards together in a different manner, uh, which gave us a 24 bit computer sit all right that, so i'm not used to microphones <laughs> is that better yeah. yeah um with a four by six bit characters um <coughs> store size from 4k up to 512k depending on the model um that's about <coughs> all i'm going to say technically if you want more information about it, it could take two or three hours, not the two or three minutes we've got. Um, a suggestion is if anybody is that interested, maybe somebody like the TMOC could set up a workshop for the 1900 or the Elliot 803 or anything else. The range was um, announced in 1964. Uh, as a rival to IBM's newly announced 360 range. And we're looking in IBM terms of something between a 360-20 to a 370-158 from the bottom of the range to the top of the range, roughly speaking. And the pink figures, the 100% is the power, are taken as the power of the 
1906 S and the the other figures are the, those machines relative to the 1906 S. Um, the 1900 series continued with these very successful 2903, 2904 and MB29, which although new technology uh, mimicked the 1900 instruction set, meaning a whole range of software was instantly available for them. And then we had onset CME, DME and CME on the bigger 2900s, again keeping to the 1900 software. Um, from what they were saying earlier, the 1900 always needed an executive. That was the base layer of software. It was a bit like a cross between DOS and the BIOS and the PC. Um, we, we vary, uh, vary from Uh, something like the small N1A, which would run one executive on one program, uh, through the bigger machines where you might have George 1 or George 2, uh, Maximop running several users, with George 2 running several background jobs, up to George 3 running multiple users and background jobs. Again, it, the structure is basic software structure of the same executive operating system. <coughs> Um, first of all, we need to thank David and Delwyn for their excellent George 3 emulator, uh, which, we, which we used to bootstrap this project. Without it, we couldn't have done it. Um, I also used it um, to assist in the recovery of the, the 1977 Malawi census data. They still had the tapes, but they had done. Um, lost the instructions of how the tapes were formatted. Um, having a 1900 environment made it easy, or relatively easy, to go back and understand it and recover the data uh, for the project. Why the uh, a new emulator when we've already got a good one? Uh, my main a fault what I find with the G3EE is it runs at modern machine speeds. It doesn't give you uh, a realistic view of what it was like to run a be working on a computer in the 1960s and 70s. It's too fast. It is too fast. Um, plus we wanted to run other operating systems other than George 3 in their native environments, things like Maximop, George 2, George 1, uh, hence the hardware approach. Okay. Okay. And we believe that software preservation is not just the preservation of the bits and bytes, it's actually being able to run those programs. Um, as David said, the hardware is not important. <laughs> Not totally agree with them there, but um, it's keeping the software and showing how the software would run, what it would do, is the important, the important thing. You know, what is an artifact? Is it this, a manual locked away in a cupboard where nobody can get at it, or the information contained in it? I'm not saying that if we extract the information, the manual will be thrown away, because it is highly likely that the paper copy will out outlast the electronic copy in terms of usability. <laughs> um, we're finding that with old parchments from the past. Um, they are finding problems in Hollywood at the moment with all these different film form, digital film formats. We've had problems with the computer industry. Seven track tapes, nine track tapes, can we still get data back from the 
10 track uh, 1301 tapes. With the changing standards, the electronic copies aren't so clever. Um, we started with the 1904S emulator because that's what we had the most information on. Um, and that covers a whole range of machines, as you can see. Um, we then went on to the 1901A emulator and then the 1905 emulator, which again covers a range of machines. Um, I, I inherited a listing from Bernard Apps, who was an ICO engineer when he moved to Australia. It was a, a compilation <coughs> listing of E1HS Executive, which was duly rekeyed, keying errors corrected, original keying errors corrected, <laughs> uh, which led to a basic machine running uh, with no operator's console. It was all done by clicking hands keys. And as you can see, eventually. You set the instruction on the hand keys. <coughs> The operating commands will put it on the hand keys, you press go, when the hall light came on, you read the light to, see, uh, to interpret the message. And it does actually load and run a program. Load another set of cards into the card reader. is the only machine in the range that doesn't need a console typewriter. All of the other 1901, the bigger 1901As, the, the, it's just this baby one that you get away without the console typewriter. <coughs> it was originally, I think, designed as a repla first machine replacement for a tabulator um, with a programming language, Nicole, for which you actually set up your program much the same as your program uh, tabulator covers. Um, also in the post, I received a hefty listing, which was a partial compilation of Maximop version 4J. We had a working Maximop version 6A from the MGS Live store, but there was no way to reconfigure it. Um, with a lot of rekeying, reverse engineering of the binary 6A, we actually produced recreated a source that was about 95% 90, complete. Um, but just about got that running, then Delvin found one of these tapes in Bracknell Basement, was the official release <laughs> of the maximum. Um, but it does mean we have the complete system now, and we can run both the maximum and maxi batch, and it's running here alongside George II. It wasn't a trivial job, it was several man months work over about a three year period. That's just feeding some more, another batch of jobs into George too. batch background, so we're showing off the multi-processing capability of the 1900s. Um, 
and just waiting there to put a job into George 2. You could pump, put jobs into, into George 2 from Maximo. So if you wanted um, to keep the maximal core usage down, you could um, fire the jobs at the battery run alongside maximal much, much faster. source code is a rarity but it does happen normally with reverse engineering binary uh, to find out how programs work, what they do. We have a large database of ICL program names um, so if it's a standard name program you've usually got a fair idea of what it does. some projects we are very very lucky with the amount of documentation and software we have available switch into light pen mode and we're drawing lines but I don't think um, they're anywhere near the points <laughs> uh, partly due to not understanding fully the 1830 uh, 
that's as close as we can get. Um, what do we have? Well, we've got software for basic peripherals, magnetic tapes, sorts of energies, disk utilities, um, utilities for the giant Bryant disks. Yes. Um, we've even got utilities for a magnetic card file. Uh, also, various application software, um, technical publications. We've got well over 200 ICO technical manuals. Uh, we have internal manuals, logics for various machines, um, in some cases, partial, which has helped us develop the hardware emulators. Um, in addition, I'm trying to write some demonstration software suites to show how these machines were be used originally. Uh, they were saying about compilers. We have quite, quite a range of compilers available. The standard ICO now have got 16 Cohen, Fortran, Nicole, Plan, the consolidators to go with them, uh, linkers. Um, conversational languages, basic and gene. Uh, we've got a couple of different assemblers, a few versions of the gene language, gene assembler, which was used to write the George operating systems. Uh, we've recently acquired a copy of Placid, which was used internally by ICO for writing software and compilers. Uh, we've got cross assemblers for the 7903. Uh, we have Algol 68, as David said. Um, we recently got a copy of BCPL, and John Hughes has done a lot of work on that to fill in the missing bits and get, get it working. Uh, we have a Fortran 77 compiler, a uh, Pascal compiler from Queen's University of Belfast, which Bill likes playing with because he worked on, he used it as an undergraduate, and he came across a bug, and the documentation says contact a William Findlay at Glasgow University. So he did, and quite a surprise, he actually got a reply back and fixed within a few days with a fix for a 40-year-old bug. In the same way, when I was looking at George II Plus, I suddenly realised I was fixing a bug I fixed back in 1979. <laughs> so, we're missing we found the bug in Pedro Valdo. Yeah, yeah, they're there. We found a couple of executive bugs, a very few. And to be honest, if we suspect an executive bug, we do a lot of digging with what we've done before we blame the software. We, we treat things like executive and ICO software as being correct unless we can prove otherwise. Um, otherwise, we'd be making modifications to the emulators to get around problems which are really our fault. Um, we're missing a language called Cecil. I know nothing much about it, apart from it's developed by education division for use in schools. Coral um, 66. Yeah. Um, we haven't got Coral 66. We did have some information on it sent to us, but the uh, chap who was doing it disappeared off the net. Um, Emma, extended Mercury Auto Code. We've got the name, <coughs> we've got the George Von Macro to run the compiler, but we're missing the compiler, unfortunately. Um, Forcom Conversation Fortran, again, we haven't got that. But that's something we have got is a City and Guilds compiler. Which is not on there, which I believe the Anatomy 903 has got as well. 903. 903, sorry. Yeah, we recently found copies, that was one missing item in our library. Yeah. Yes, um, it seems to be a standard thing that um, companies have to sort of provide. If they want to do education, they yes. have to load everything. What's it need to do? Not very high. Sorry? No, it's not very high at all, it's very low level. Oh, very low level, low level, level yes. Well, I, I do find a manual on it. Uh, talking of executives, we have a copy of E1HS. Uh, Delwyn discovered fairly recently 
the first tape of the two tape set, the E1DS, which is a, again from 1901, but with discs and mapping tapes. The first tape is the one that you load every day. The second tape are the overlays, which would be written to the disc once by the site engineer and then put it on a shelf and forgotten. Um, we have got it partly running by writing replacement overlays. Uh, we don't in any way say they match the originals, but they match the original functionality. Uh, with a copy of E3MG for a 1902 T for tools through, courtesy of Dillman and MGS. Um, we found a paper tape, one amongst many of but we thought it was an assembler. After Rod read it and we investigated, we actually found it was the loader patcher with a full copy of E4BM for the Putney Bridge House 1905, dating back to 1967. <laughs> Um, for the more modern executives, we have the full generation system so we can generate effects to our own configurations. Um, we have a set of most of the George operating systems in binary format. Uh, some of them we've got sourced for as well. Uh, we have some Minimop, but we do have Maximop. Uh, so we can pretty much run most of the ICO operating systems and we've, we've, we've recovered most. Um, <coughs> this is just a simple demonstration shown in 1905 running the engineer's test program for graph plotter, um, which shows you very much little until it finishes because unfortunately with the graph plotter it had a paper roll 120 feet long by either 31 inches or 12 inches wide so we have to process it, have the plot finished before we can process it to find its size for scaling uh, but having reverse engineered that executive we have now repackaged it so that using an executive generator we can gener regenerate it to different configurations within the packages we have Uh, Bill did some of the work. A lot of these things are joint projects. One of us takes a lead, another follows on them. So nothing is, shall we say, one or the other of us. <laughs> There's a plot, and as I say, all the good films. That's <laughs> what <laughs> Say some, and miss some of the art, I'll upset somebody. But basically, we've had from the Maximop team, the 1906A development team, we've recently been in contact with Canada for the FP6000 people, uh, we've had information from Stevenage engineers, um, Bill Finley fixing a compiler bug from 40 years ago, and it just goes on. And so an interesting little thing in the paper today, 20th of September 1966, at a veterans gathering in America of 76 couples, they did a computer match to find the most compatible couples. The computer only picked two of them correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Were you one of them? <laughs> Well, only for the same question, really, yeah. I suppose, yeah. Okay, we need to be conscious Bill. of the bit. Uh, yes, we just got a question. Okay. Yeah, I think that's still working. Okay. So, if there are any questions, I think um, the Bill's on the line as well, in case there's anything that he needs to answer. Anyone? Do you want me to run over there? Yeah. 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 Uh, right, I got an email that we received last week from a, from a remote member of our group, Peter Kinsman, I think he's somewhere over towards Wales, couldn't get him in person. But he remembers giving a talk to the Elliot Computing Users Association about how he wrote a bit of, he wrote a bit of software. He asked me whether I remember him giving a talk about this item, uh, which was um, uh, 
tap, tap something. Um, tap it? No, tap things, tap one hand. Um, but also, yes, tap one hand. But it, we replicated the functions of package meter, and that's a, an ICL package. So his question is, does anybody here know anything about meter? No. 1900 yeah. tabulator import generator. That's a no. That's my question. I used to be a system manager for Vax VMS systems, so I've got that sort of experience of running computers. Um, my experience of ICL systems is as a student putting Fortran programs in. Mm. Um, so I'm interested in learning about um, what you needed to do to run computer systems like this. I've, I've got the um, the, uh, George, the emulator, and I'll just dabble a little with that. What advice would you have for how I can progress in my goal of learning what it was like to run these things? <laughs> well, that's, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, you can visit TMOC and see a real machine running. Um, Indeed. We don't have all the compilers available online at the moment, so that is an ambition to, to achieve that for people who want to come along and actually recreate things. Yeah. But in terms of playing with things at home, with emulators, um, what, do, what, what do I need to learn to say, oh yes, I mean, I'm just, uh, to get the things going, I'm just blindly following the scripts. Mm -hmm. Right, so you've got the George, the instructions that are on Brian's yes. website. Yes, I do. How far do they go, Brian? I'm not sure whether you've got um, those days recently. No, I have works for your emulator. Yeah, I'm not sure. Hey, I'm getting the system running, I just feel I don't really understand what I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> There are, um, yeah, there is quite a steep learning curve. I mean, obviously, yes. the money will stand yep. go through yep. Yep. Is, is the next step. Um, the George introductory manuals are actually quite good at telling you what you need to do. Um, I think we do we do have some uh, simplified easy guides as well, which I think may be on your website. Yes, and then there's a there's a guide um, written by the University of Manchester for people using their computer networks, right. which is a simplified guide to using <laughs> George Mop service and that's something that's Manchester specific but it's yeah. generally that's fine, right. I was at Manchester. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> that, that was the package for the George Lee and that's an issue. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. I will dive back into this when you didn't think you, you were basically asking about what's involved when you're the manager of the system. Yes. Um, that's right. Yeah. Because when uh, making online facilities to enable people to run uh, user software, I have only half seriously thought of having a website facility which offers you an overnight turnaround. That, that's part of the experience. I <laughs> <laughs> don't really have the slightest hint about it. Actually, part, part of the student experience of using the 1900 format in my case was submitting the job, then going to the pub, and then staggering back to the computer centre at half past eleven, if you can find it. Still. <laughs> the results. Yeah. To see which error messages have come up. <laughs> oh, yeah, try and fix it in that strong state. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Oh, sorry. There we go. I'd like to comment that one of the most important experiences from the point of view of operating one of these machines is the sound in the computer. Mm. <laughs> and do the emulators actually produce <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you that the, the George 3 exec emulator doesn't. Um, and the reason for that is because to, to produce the sound, you need to be emulating the way that the hardware works very precisely. And the sounds were unique to each machine as well, and you need to run at the, at the right speed. It's not, it's not not only the speaker sound, it's the sound of the peripherals as well. <coughs> yes, so, so G3 Exec doesn't produce any sound. Do you have plans for sound, yeah. Brian? Uh, we don't, we have tried sound, but it causes problems. Um, so, no, we don't have sound, but we do have GUI peripherals, so you can see the tapes are on the um, You may have spotted that as a card reader is reading cards, a progress bar is reading down, so you can see how how far the peripherals are going, the line printer is actually going to print. You see the line printer, line flow coming up the page with your printout on it. So you do get visual feedback. 
And I would say that visual feedback, as if you were in a computer room, has been very useful sometimes debugging, where you actually see, you might not hear the program running, but you can see it running, you can see it moving the tape bit, you can see it rewind or move forward, and it gives you a clue as to what the program's doing when things <coughs> stop. So that visual feedback is there in our emulator, but without sound. What you could do is get yourself a tally type and you've got a little interface, hook it up to uh, one of the emulators and then sit bashing away. That gives you a pretty, pretty good experience there. Yeah. Uh, oh, we've got that on the teletype. Yes, we've got the teletype sound, but not the main sounds. Have you actually sure. got um, a, a teletype emulator? Because it's a while ago I did uh, an online search to try and find uh, a teletype emulation where what it would actually do was look like a teletype and so you could actually use it as your uh, access to a mock terminal and you would in fact get the uh, right kind of sense, the right kind of timing, just that you might drop asleep with boredom, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our teletype so. does run at 10 CPS, right. um, with the sound of the characters clattering as well if you want. <laughs> Go for it. Yes. Hello. Um, I was half of the development team for something called the extended mathematical unit, which plugged into the 1903, right? Yeah. And the other half was a gentleman by the name of Keith Crook. I don't know if he's here today. Um, to test the unit, I decided no better way to test maths than to calculate pi. <laughs> and I wrote a program in machine code to calculate pi, and we ran it to 20,000 places. If I'd have known, I'd have run it for double the time and got the then world record, but <laughs> that's another story. I have, gathering dust at home, the original paper tape. It's about that diameter reel of paper tape. Can you run it? Well, I, I can certainly read it for you. That's not that's not a problem. I said, what, what kind of program is it? Is it? Uh, yeah. Well, it was written in machine code. I think it's a binary dump. Uh, I I'm, I may even be loadable. Yeah, I mean the short answer is yes. You've got a paper tape reader. We have paper tape reader. We can we can recover on the emulator. Almost anything. Our discs are the difficult thing for recovery. But we should have to the link up and see if it will take less than the three and a half hours it took uh, <laughs> to run it to 20,000 places. Yeah, absolutely. If you'd like to, if you'd like that read, if you'd like, if you'd like to post it to us at TNMOC or um, if you've got it with you. Or whatever. <laughs> I should have brought it. Um, yeah, so you, you can send that for my attention at TNMOC and we can get that read for you, not a problem. If you look at the current resurrection, there's a, a, a paper I put in there about Mersenne primes. Uh, that too is a very good test. Um, it teased out the, well, I was most heartened that my KDF9 emulator ran it correctly the first time and it involves millions of 47-bit divisions. Yeah. Uh, just as a matter of amusement, uh, when we first ran it, it gave the wrong answer. <laughs> and my boss said, fine programmer you are. So I ran it again, and it, ra it produced a different wrong, wrong answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> I ran it again, and every time it was different. And we put a scope on the machine, and found out because of the recursive nature of the program, there were electronic spikes being produced <laughs> everywhere and we had to modify the electronics <laughs> and then it worked. <laughs> so in other words it did its job as a test program. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I think with regard to uh, the computer producing noises, I have a, a memory of installing the 2970 uh, alongside the 1904S at Pumps and Spencers. Um, we found it quite useful to listen to the hooter on the 2970 so we could 
have some idea of what it was, how far it had got, and what it was trying to do. Um, the operators who were on full production on the 1904S objected to this dreadful noise and said, could you please turn it off? And we said, yes, certainly, but you're running the two line printers with the hoods up. They said, well, that's so that we can find out what we're doing. <laughs> so they, we, we came to an agreement that they would actually close the hoods on their line printer and we would turn the, uh, turn the hooter off. Um, this lasted for two days and then found that the, the hoods on the line printer up again, so we turned the hoods back up and nothing more was said. <laughs> The, the team that developed the executives at Stevenage and quite my head, I was actually also in charge of this one for a brief time. Um, it's fascinating to, to hear your story about you know, see all the names of the executives, some of which I can remember, some of which I'm pretty sure they do. Um, a couple of which I'm quite so. The George. George R. S. was a, it was a, it was an integrated, inter-executive version of how uh, George Watt. Yes. And um, I, yeah. uh, I'm that the Yes, I, uh, uh, I saw that was how it was. I don't know how, that, how that might relate to the overlay of the same time, but it was on the Well, it is part of the year, it was the Well, I thought it was actually, I thought it was We have no intention of trying to recreate the one. Uh, oh, no, we, we, I can't understand. It took rather a long time, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, think, we think we have an automatic operator to work. Oh, an automatic operator, I actually, I actually designed that. Right. We have an impression <coughs> that George Ryan lives, sits, sits on top of an automatic operator and uses those facilities to work. No, 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 that's wrong. No, no, no. no George Ryan was over there, he's building an infected. Yes. Automatic operator was a sort of little cunning, um, <coughs> cheap uh, method of being able to get the tape. One one other question though is, um, the did you did you come across the cassette tape uh, that was used on 1901 and was it run under E1 HS? E1 HS but we know of these cassette tapes, but we have no software for them at all. But I, I guess that the E1HS, if you've got the E1HS with that module in, will it actually have the software that will run them? Um, the version of E1DS that we've got, no, E1HS. E1HS is purely basic peripherals, card reader, Line I, thought paper ran, tape. I, thought, I thought one version of Ram accepted as well. It, it, may, it, may, it may have done, but not in the version oh, that okay. we have. Okay. Um, the D1DS we got is configured for 1971 7 track tapes and EDS 8s. Um, again, no cassette tape. No, well, the DS would have been the latest version because that, that would have to run on the original line as well. No. Unfortunately, yeah, most of the executives are not the only ones who don't have the binary, we don't have the source for all the packages. The later ones, the, the book, we have the full, the full source, so we have all the packages for those. I'm yeah. a bit confused when you say that you don't emulate the um, hardware, because you presumably must be emulating the instruction sets, the, the basic instruction that, sets. That's right. My, my interest is on preserving software in such a way that it can actually be run. Because frankly, if you can't run it, you can't really see it. And so, when I said you don't implement the actual hardware, it's a matter, couldn't we want, no, it doesn't matter. It's a matter of choosing which interface. The actual hardware, I don't even know how a 1900 drives the peripherals at the hardware level. But there is this Perry instruction which tells the executive to do something with a peripheral. <coughs> and so I implement the Perry instruction, which is not a hardware instruction, except that it causes an interrupt, which then... Yeah, but the you must presume it be implementing the ordinary add and load and store... Yeah, and well, yes, stuff. yes. But, but that's a virtual machine. The, clearly, if you draw a Venn diagram of the instructions, there's a tremendous overlap between that and the real machine. 
but there are all these things called extra codes which are not things that the hardware understands apart from the fact that the hardware causes an interrupt and then it's the software, the executive that understands it and so I'm implementing the virtual machine as seen by George 3 rather than the actual hardware machine but yes there's obviously a serious overlap and uh, that's what in my view that provides the best way of making the software run. Now, if you're talking about the noise of the printers and the whistles and this kind of thing, then that's one person's interest and they're quite, quite welcome to be interested in that. But I'm interested in software production and how software's evolved over the years and so uh, actually making it work is much more important than making it look like a real machine. What day did you do demonstration? Sorry. No. What day did you do this? I think I've done it. He's implemented the hardware instructions that the user sees. Yeah, I think there are a number of Well, there are my instructions. The instructions that George 3 sees. Yes, but there are another set of instructions at machine level that he's actually and the peripherals, etc. And they actually vary between the machines and range. So you did your... Okay, so I wanted to make another point. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of that. Sorry. Um, I wanted to make another point, and that was that when you did your demonstration back in 2012, um, I was amazed at how much smaller the Raspberry Pi was than the... <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I worked out what it should be according to laws. <laughs> um, and according to Moore's law, from uh, I was going on the 1906A in 1971 to, to 2012. So according to Moore's law, it should be a million and a half times faster and cheaper and smaller. Um, I looked at the, the size of the machine, and I reckon you've got 19 cabinets, and they were six foot by um, And the uh, Raspberry Pi is 100 mil millimetres. <laughs> so that's about 5,600 times. <laughs> Nowhere near the <laughs> one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, wait a minute. What you've forgotten is that this is a cost effectiveness. So you have to divide by the price to get the ratio. And I think you'll yes. find <laughs> it's rather <laughs> different. The, the price, <laughs> the, the price, well, maybe I should explain how much I'm right. The, the price was um, half a million. In, uh, for the 1906A, and the price of a Raspberry Pi at the time was, was 61 pounds. Yeah, well, it's 33, that's what I do. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I included the power supply in the front shop. Oh, I see. That. I, and that was at the time. So that was, that was, that was 7,500 times. So maybe if you want to work 7,500 times. Did you include the installation cost? <laughs> <laughs> I run my Raspberry Pi well, domestic <laughs> server on the USB socket from the uh, router. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the cost of the backing store uh, was about um, £200,000 for the Nintendo's. This was, I think this was the EPS backing store. And it was uh, £9.50 for the Raspberry Pi. That's presumably cost down quite considerably. So that's 19... 20,000 times um, less. So, have to stop you there. Yeah. Really, it's going to close. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very aware there's still questions, which is a natural reaction to a brilliant presentation. Uh, always leave them wanting more, isn't that? That's the really theatrical thing. So, I'm sure if you want to come and talk with the group afterwards with the remaining questions, they'll be happy to do that. So, thanks for that. Um, it's absolutely fascinating, as always, to hear somebody else's work and as a group, the, the diverse nature of the skills and even the ambition. What I would rather like is that two aspects of conservation, both legitimate but different, have been put together in one presentation, which I think is exactly right. And we're quite spread out. Brian lives in the West Country, Delvin's in London, and I'm in the Yorkshire Dale. There you go. <laughs> it must be something to do with computers and communication. Anyway, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, Derwin, Brian, David, and please appreciate it in a normal way. Thank you. Very much.